All right, our next topic is a rather small one, so this will be short. We're going to go over the anterior horn cell diseases. So remember that uh, we are going through the neuro axis starting from the bottom up. And so our yellow here, this is our last uh, in this category. Remember, these are all lower motor neuron conditions. So the lower motor neuron in the spinal cord is the, are the anterior horn cells. And then last time we talked about the projection uh, through the motor nerve root. Of course, we have a sensory nerve root. So radiculopathies, plexopathies, and peripheral nerves. So any problem here, we're going to have lower motor neuron findings. Atrophy, fasciculations, flaccid weakness, and so on. And so here is a section of the spinal cord. This is about C8. And so we can see a pretty big ventral horn right here with lots of anterior horn cells. And that's because at C8, um, this supplies a lot of hand muscles. So we need a lot of anterior horn cells in this location. And then we can see little uh, the roots coming out from anterior horn cells here from the ventral horn. Now, uh, as we move up into the medulla, um, you know, these anterior horn cells, um, we have lower motor neurons in the brainstem. And so the brainstem is just the rostral continuation of the spinal cord. So, for example, here is the hypoglossal nucleus right here. And we can sort of follow the hypoglossal nerve coming out right here, going out to the tongue. So these are just like anterior horn cells, but now they're... Um, in the brainstem, and so we name them specifically hypoglossal nucleus. Um, out in this location, we have the nucleus ambiguous in the lateral medulla, which is motor for 9 and 10. And so just to recognize that we do have lower motor neurons in the brainstem, and most importantly for this lecture, we will see that conditions like polio and ALS frequently will involve not only anterior horn cells in the spinal cord, but also the lower motor neurons in the medulla as well. All right, so polio, of course, we don't see many new cases of polio today, but we still see individuals that had polio and have lived with weakness for many decades because of the polio uh, that they contracted earlier in life. So the lesion is anterior horn cells. And since they're lower motor neurons, it's a flaccid, floppy weakness. And this comes on acutely. And so uh, during when we talk about Guillain-Barre syndrome, I mentioned that that is now the most common cause of an acute flaccid paralysis. It used to be polio many decades ago. And so uh, the presentation is with asymmetrical weakness, atrophy. Anytime you have a problem with anterior horn cells, there tend to be a lot of cramps. And then fasciculations are classic for an anterior horn cell disease. And because this only affects the motor neurons, patients have normal sensation. Okay, so here's just a picture of polio showing you the problem is with the anterior horn cells. And then we're going to get Wallerian degeneration here through the roots and plexus and peripheral nerve. And so these tend to affect more of the lower extremities, but it certainly can affect the upper extremities. But this would just show you, in this case, the patient mainly had involvement of thoracic anterior horn cells, and so they're going to have bilateral leg weakness, atrophy, fasciculations. So most individuals are not symptomatic. 5 to 10 percent have some minor symptoms. It's only 0.1 percent that go on to develop meningitis, okay, and then that progresses into this lower motor neuron uh, weakness due to anterior horn cell destruction. And so the mechanism here is that this crosses the blood-brain barrier via retrogradal, retrograde axonal transport, gets into the spinal cord and into the lower brain stem, especially <clears throat> the medulla. So may, most patients present with weakness in the extremities, but if it does involve these lower motor neurons in the medulla, like hypoglossal and nucleus ambiguous that I mentioned, patients may have some dysarthria and dysphagia um, in addition to um, the extremity weakness. So if you're talking with someone that had polio, you would expect to get a story of a patient who was pretty sick with meningitis and then in that context developed weakness. <clears throat> so polio can be diagnosed by doing the lumbar puncture. We can do PCR analysis. Treatment is supportive and uh, sort of just like Guillain-Barre syndrome, respiratory failure, 
um, is the biggest thing you want to watch out for in the acute setting of polio. Now, sort of the modern day polio is West Nile virus. So, of course, this is um, um, transmitted by mosquito bites. And so we see this uh, cases mainly in late summer or early fall. And so just as a big picture, you can see this is quite uncommon. Nervous system involvement was uncommon, only 19 reported cases in 2000. And we've been hanging around, I think, 2,000 cases or so per year in the United States um, since then. And so you can see that, uh, you know, incidence of this is highest in areas like North Dakota, South Dakota. And I can testify, having done a camping trip there um, a few years ago in September, that there are a lot of mosquitoes in that area. So there's an incubation period. Most people are asymptomatic. 25% will develop what's called a West Nile fever, where, you know, there's some rash, fever, headache, and you can see less than 1% actually have neurologic involvement. So sort of like polio, it's a headache, neck stiffness, fever, meningitis, encephalitis. Remember the difference here, encephalitis means there's actually involvement of the brain parenchyma, not just the coverings of the brain. And so in an encephalitis, then patients may have focal findings, aphasia, hemiplegia, uh, may have a seizure due to irritation of uh, cortical neurons. And so about overall 8% of patients that have neurologic involvement will develop this uh, acute flaccid paralysis from anterior horn cell involvement. All right, so we can do IgM antibodies on the serum. And this can also be checked in the cerebral spinal fluid. If you do a lumbar puncture, you're going to see findings that are consistent with a meningitis encephalitis. But because it's viral, the glucose will be normal. If you do an MRI scan and the patient had encephalitis, you're going to see signal intensities in those areas of the brain that are involved in the encephalitis. Right now, ALS is quite different than polio and West Nile. The anterior horn cells are certainly involved. The medulla lower motor neurons are certainly involved. But ALS is different in that the cortical neurons are involved. So um, this is really a true motor neuron disease. It affects all the motor neurons. The upper motor neurons here, like the cortical spinal tract, the cortical bulbar tract, and the lower motor neurons, the anterior horn cells, and here's the hypoglossal nucleus uh, going out to the tongue. And so the reason weakness is so rapidly progressive in ALS is that it's a double hit on the motor neurons, upper and lower motor neuron. Right, so patients here now present with a mixture of upper and lower motor neuron findings. Of course, many patients will know this as Lou Gehrig's disease. I think this is Lou Gehrig's last um, uh, photo um, here as a member of the New York Yankees or on his baseball card. And some neurologists have commented that it looks like there may be some atrophy um, here of this hand. All right, so the upper motor neurons that degenerate are the cortical spinal tract and the cortical bulbar tract. So remember the cortical bulbar tract is how the brain talks to the brain stem. And for ALS, it's mainly the cortical bulbar tract that supplies the medulla. And so when that degenerates early, patients develop what's called a pseudobulbar palsy. And so this is dysarthria, dysphagia, and also emotional incontinence. So they laugh and cry, um, often uncontrollably. All right, so here's the cortical bulbar tract. And again, this is how the cortex talks to all of the lower motor neurons in the brainstem. But for ALS, it's mainly nucleus ambiguous, so that's motor for 9 and 10, and the hypoglossal nucleus. All right. So if the problem starts up here with the cortical bulbar tract, um, then the patient will have pseudobulbar palsy. If the degeneration starts in the nucleus ambiguous and hypoglossal nucleus, so more of a lower motor neuron presentation, then that's called a bulbar palsy. And uh, the only difference, so both patients have dysarthria and dysphagia. But if we have bulbar palsy, where the problem is down here, they're not going to have the emotional incontinence. Uh, but instead, they will have a lot of atrophy of the tongue, right? Because you're involving the lower motor neuron here. You might see some tongue uh, fasciculations. 
And overall, this has the worst prognosis when it's onset with uh, bulbar, um, uh, bulbar palsy. Now, if we do an MRI scan, we can sometimes see the Wallerian degeneration here of the cortical spinal and cortical bulbar tract as it travels through the genu and internal capsule and through the pons. All right, so uh, there's upper motor neuron involvement and there's lower motor neuron involvement. So the anterior horn cells get knocked out. <clears throat> so there's weakness, fasciculations, atrophy, loss of reflexes, and the brain stem lower motor neurons that are affected are mainly nucleus ambiguous and hypoglossal. So again, dysarthria, dysphagias, um, due to, it will cause bulbar palsy um, if the degeneration is here, and we'll look at the tongue for atrophy. So patients with ALS, as they evolve, it may start out with more of an upper motor neuron presentation or a lower motor neuron presentation, but over time, they're gonna have both upper and lower motor neuron findings. All right, so weakness is the initial symptom of ALS, and so it can start out in the arm or hand or in the leg or foot, so foot drop, for example, would be very common in ALS, and about 20% will have onset with dysarthria and dysphagia. <clears throat> so here's a nice drawing that a student did a few years ago to show you we have a problem here that starts in the cortical neurons, and then we get Wallerian degeneration down through the cortical spinal tract, and then we have a double hit here now on the anterior horn cells, and so again, Wallerian degeneration. And so the drawing here is meant to show you in purple, the upper, and in yellow, the lower motor neuron findings. And notice the drawing goes from the mouth down because brainstem involvement in ALS is mainly in the medulla. So things that are higher up, like eye movements and vision, um, that is relatively preserved in ALS. <clears throat> so what is preserved? Uh, the higher brainstem motor nuclei, like I mentioned. So eye movements are normal until very late. Sensory nerves are relatively preserved in ALS, so your sensory exam is pretty unremarkable. And bowel and bladder, even though we have these anterior horn cells <clears throat> in the sacral cord called onus nucleus, <clears throat> those tend to be preserved in ALS. So they have normal bowel and bladder function. All right, so incidence of ALS, about two per 100,000. No more than five to 10% of ALS cases are familial. And so here it's usually not much of a mystery because it's autosomal dominant. There's a little bit of difference. The age of onset is earlier. Peak incidence for sporadic ALS is between 55 and 75. And most patients die within three to four years of the onset of symptoms. Let me just say a little bit about genetics. Um, I think boards would still more likely ask you about uh, superox superoxide dismutase uh, mutations because that was the first genetic mutation that was found in ALS. But you can see that only makes up 10% of familial ALS. And since all ALS, uh, since only 5 to 10% of all ALS is familial, very rare that we see superoxide dismutase. I think more practical to know about is the C9ORF72 mutations. So this makes up almost half of all familial ALS cases and five to 8% of sporadic ALS. So this is a very important um, mutation and also relevant to know that these mutations are associated not only with ALS but frontotemporal dementia. So about one in 10 patients with ALS will have a frontotemporal dementia. And um, overall, 50% of ALS patients will have some mild cognitive uh, behavioral involvement. All right, so I'll, I'll, later on, we'll go into the details of frontotemporal dementia. But uh, just to remember, there is some overlap with uh, ALS. Now, some patients with ALS present purely with lower motor neurons involvement. They never have upper motor non-involvement. And if that's the case, we call it progressive muscular atrophy. Some patients have only upper motor neuron findings. They never develop lower motor neuron findings. And if that's the case, we call it primary lateral sclerosis. So I think this reflects really that this is a spectrum disorder. Most commonly, it's both upper and lower motor neurons. 
And in my experience, most patients where I thought maybe they had progressive muscular atrophy or primary lateral sclerosis, over time, those patients will develop both upper and lower motor neuron findings. So really use all um, is an anti-glutamatergic uh, medication against the NMDA receptor, and it may inhibit somewhat release of uh, glutamate as well. Um, re recall unique things about the NMDA uh, receptor. It has this magnesium binding site, which sort of has to pop out in order for a flow of uh, both sodium and calcium um, through this channel. And so um, it's felt that perhaps overactivation of any NMDA receptor may be responsible for destruction of motor neurons. But really, even in the best case spin we can put on really is all that extends life for two to three months. So it's not a dramatic breakthrough. There have been some very uh, recent exciting things in the area of ALS. But since we're just doing this as a quick board review, I don't think you're likely uh, to be asked about those. Okay. Like a new medication, Adaravone, um, but its role clinically has really not been fully um, outlined. Okay, and I'll just make a comment on this. I don't have this in your handout, but if those of you that are doing pediatric neurology, there is a, an anterior horn cell disease called spinal muscular atrophy um, that just like polio and ALS, you know, affects the anterior horn cells in the spinal cord, but also in the lower medulla. And so these typically children have progressive lower motor neuron findings. You can see there's a type zero through four. And so zero is the prenatal form, usually death within a month. SMA type one is infantile, usually death, you know, by two to three years. And so these are really horrible conditions. Type four is an adult onset spinal muscular atrophy, which is really rare. And so there's a lot about the genetics um, of these conditions, which I think really go beyond uh, the scope of uh, what you need to know at this time. All right, so that's all for anterior horn cell diseases.